Hello, hello again, friends. Thanks for joining us. We've had such a busy day and it is not over yet. We have a couple of more really interesting experiments and demos here for Super Science Saturday today. So um, I'm gonna introduce you to some really special friends in just a minute, Zeus, Poseidon, and Athena. You may have heard their names before. And they came across a very mysterious thing recently that they're gonna dive into a little bit with you. A very interesting science question having to do with some gases in the air, which here at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, is what we spend a lot of time studying. Different gases in the air and how the air moves and how the air works. And so I think they'll probably tell you a little bit more from there. I'm gonna turn it over to Zeus, Athena, and Poseidon. Well, good to see you all here. This Hi. instance you're about to see came across because I saw something funny happening around me and I investigated. And that's the essence of science is looking, making observations around you. There's another portion of it. I came across a problem and I thought I could beat my head against the wall and solve it myself after a long time. But I thought I'm gonna talk with a friend who's very knowledgeable and work out the problem together. Welcome to Super Science Saturday. I am Zeus, god of thunder and lord of the sky. But today, I'm just dad, because you see, tomorrow, it's Athene's birthday party. She's going to be 3,500 years old. And Neptune and I are preparing a surprise party for her. we got some nice birthday balloons here and some ambrosia and nectar. And we're going to get it all ready, and we're going to have a good party. All right, let's go. What, 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 what's going on here? What's going on? Uh, that was weird. The ambrosia fell over, but these balloons, when I started up, they went forward. That's peculiar. Let me try that again. The balloons go forward as I accelerate. And then when I stop, they go backward. Wait, one more time, one more time, just to be sure. Okay, accelerate. Peculiar. I could figure this out, but I'm going to talk to my brother Neptune. He's the god of the sea, and he knows all about fluids. And something about this reminds me of fluids sloshing back and forth in the tides in the ocean. So I'm going to go talk to him, and we'll figure out this little problem here. Well, here I am on Mount Olympus. Got to call Neptune, but since we're in Greece... Hey! Poseidon! Probably off on a dive trip with Percy Jackson. Poseidon! Uh, hey, Zeus! Hey, Poseidon, what's going on? Yeah, I just got back from my afternoon dive. Yeah, excellent. Really good. You yes. got your trident? Well, I had to check the trident at the door. I'm actually oh. heading over to the barbecue. All right, yeah, it's going to be fun. Athene's going to be 3,500 years old. Wow, can you believe that? I got a quick question for you, though. Yeah. You know how balloons, normally when I go somewhere, they drift behind me. Mm -hmm. See, like this, mm -hmm. and then like that. Sure, yeah. Well, I was in the car, and when I accelerated, they went forward. Huh. And this was really strange. So since you're a fluids god, and also hydrodynamics and stuff, maybe you could explain just what's going on here with these balloons. Yes, well, you came to the right person, Zeus. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the thing is that air is uh, fluid. Uh -huh. So it has mass and it has momentum. Okay. And it responds to changes in density, for example. Okay. And it's a compressible fluid, not like water, which is a fluid and flows, but um, air actually responds to changes in density too. Okay. You can squeeze it and everything. So yeah. in my car, the balloons went the wrong way. Does that mean air has Matt? I thought air was just like this drifty, misty thing that was all over the place, but 
It has mass and momentum? Yes, it does, yeah. It has oh. both of those things. Hmm. So remember when you're in the car and you accelerate, you feel uh, like you're being pushed backwards. And the ambrosia rolls to the back of the car. Right, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And, but in actual fact, the, the car is moving forwards and you feel that force against you, so it feels like you're being pushed back. Okay. So when you start the car, the air actually moves towards the back of the car. The balloons go forward. And the balloons are lighter than air, so they sense a lower pressure I and see. move towards the lower pressure in the front of the car. Okay. Hey, hey, here comes Athene now. Maybe she. Welcome to your birthday party and happy birthday. Hi, Hi. guys. Welcome. It's nice so great to see you. Good this to see is going to be a great day. We were just chatting about these helium balloons and meteorology and air and stuff and weight. And maybe you could tell us a little more about how this affects weather. Absolutely. You know, we're surrounded by air. It's just the fluid. And any air that's less dense and more buoyant will go up, like the helium in these balloons or like hot air in a hot air balloon, or warm air into a cloud. Mm -hmm. And any air that's more dense will fall down or slosh out of the upper parts of the atmosphere. So you can have down drafts that slosh out of a thunderstorm and get hit by that cold wind as the storm's coming in. Oh, that could be dangerous. They can be dangerous. They can cause some destruction. But it can also give you a nice, cool breeze before a rainstorm as it comes in. Uh, OK. Yes. Hmm. So in my car, Things were sloshing around, kind of? How does that work? Hmm. Let me okay. show you. Okay. Just happens I have a bottle of nectar here on the floor. Okay. And you see there's a bubble in the bottle. Right. At the top. And so if I move the bottle forwards, the bubble initially moves forwards oh. as the, because the liquid moves to the back. And then eventually it moves back to the middle again. So let's try that again. Move this way. Oh, yeah. See? Yep, the bubble starts here and then moves back to the middle because the fluid is all getting, the more dense fluid is all getting pushed to the back. So Athena's helium balloons are the bubble. Yeah, essentially. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Really? They're like cool. in there. They're a bubble in the air. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's pretty neat. That's a cool experiment. You could do it at home. I like that. Mm. Well, I think I smell something in the distance. Maybe the barbecue's ready. I can't wait. Shall we go off to the party? Absolutely. Yeah, All right. Right. Let's do it. Thank you. Yes. That was so fun. Wow. That was such a cool experiment. I love that you just noticed something happening and you looked into it. That is the most fun part of science, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. So there are a couple of questions that have been coming in and we'll welcome anybody else who, who wants to ask questions to uh, go ahead and enter them in the, in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, the first question that we've got is, what eventually happens to the helium when you pop a balloon? Hmm. Well, it's, it escapes from the balloon and it mixes with the air, and but the molecules are lighter. So, Jeff, maybe you should take it from here. Yeah. So, actually, a lot of the hydrogen and helium in the atmosphere get lost to outer space because they just go up into the air, and sooner or later, since they're lighter than the air molecules, they just kind of go fast enough that they disappear out of the top. I'm glad somebody asked that. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> yeah, that is a great question. We've got another good one. So do cold temperature inversions really slosh back and forth? Yes, they do. Um, cold temperature inversions are really common on the front range in the winter where we get cold air down in the valleys between the mountains in the winter and the cold air will slosh up the sides of the mountains and down and cause clouds and fog at the top of the inversion. It's really very beautiful. So from high on Mount Olympus, I look down in the valleys and I see some sort of smoke or smog or something down there. Is that a cold inversion? Uh, not always. Sometimes there's um, warmer temperatures above that cause a stable layer above the boundary layer that can trap air as well. Um, and sometimes it's just a lot of pollution near the surface because that's where it's coming from, uh, mostly. Okay. 
I think it's so cool, too, to think about how air acts like a fluid. Just that whole idea is just really cool because we can't see what's happening in the air, but then sometimes we can use a fluid like water or maybe ambrosia to observe how the air acts even when we can't see it. Absolutely. And we can use that same type of physics for fluids in the air and use that to make our weather models and climate models that we use to forecast weather and climate with here at INCAR. Mm. Oh, cool. Well, so this is something that, that ties into what, what you've been talking about with, with helium and, and helium, what it does in air. But somebody asked what happens when, to a balloon when you let go of it. And I suppose that depends on what the balloon's filled with, huh? So if it's filled with helium, it's going to go up and up and up, but the air gets thinner farther up, so the balloon's going to get tighter and tighter. I'm not sure if it's going to pop or what's going to happen next, if it's a balloon that expands. It, the same thing will happen to just about any balloon. Depend, it doesn't matter exactly what it's filled with, because the balloon will always try to reach its level of neutral buoyancy, the place where it's the same density on the inside as it is on the outside. And sometimes a balloon has to go far up in the atmosphere, like a weather balloon, to reach that level. Sometimes it never reaches that level. Sometimes it pops before it gets that high. Uh, eventually, the air will mix in through the balloon. It seems like it's a pretty impenetrable barrier, but it's not. And molecules can go in and out through the balloon. And once it mixes enough, it will become less buoyant and fall back down. And I've found quite a few uh, wrinkled up old balloons in the woods over the years. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons why people suggest you don't release balloons too much because they will come back down and be litter somewhere. Mm -hmm. hmm. Now we saw well, drop zones oh, and rocket zones earlier this morning. Are there balloon zones too? Absolutely. What, weather balloons are shot off twice a day all over the, the world. Um, and those carry weather instruments up into the upper atmosphere to take measurements all the way up. And down. there's the picture. <laughs> 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 and you can come across those. Uh, sometimes they fall down in places where you'll find them out in the wilderness. And if you pick them up, often they'll have a, a address on them where you can mail it back to so that it doesn't stay as litter. So kind of in the, in the theme of buoyancy and things floating and flying in the air, and of course we just finished with our tour of the um, aircraft, the research aircraft, Violet is wondering, do airplanes use wind to fly? Yes. Pilots try to follow the jet stream and get into the jet stream because the jet stream is a, a bunch of very rapid wind, very rapid air, and once they sit in that, they can fly and they can go very fast in that. So their ground speed is, um, I think I've heard that they've actually measured ground speeds faster than the speed of sound, but that's not in the air. So they can go really, really fast, as long as they're in a very fast jet of wind. Mm, I see. <laughs> Okay, I'm looking for any other questions. Those were some good questions that we had this Those afternoon. Great questions. Got a bunch of curious folks out there today. I don't see any other questions coming in right now. So while we're waiting, oh. do you guys know where we get our helium from? This might surprise you. I don't know where it comes from. Oh, so we actually get it out of the ground, funnily enough. So. A lot of minerals are radioactive, and so when they decay, they give off alpha particles, which are essentially helium nuclei. And then the helium nuclei pick up electrons and become helium gas. And so there are big reserves of helium actually underground, and it's mined, and then they bring it out. And actually, it's getting a little scarce right now, so there is like a worldwide helium shortage. So. But uh, it's actually pulled out of the ground, funnily enough. You wouldn't think that something so light. 
So it comes from rocks. <laughs> it comes from rocks, basically, yeah. Air from rocks. <laughs> and then like in Boulder, we have a lot of radon gas, so that also emits helium. Wow. So we're worried about that in basements, yeah. <laughs> That's so helium is part of the nuclear decay. Yes, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So the big atoms split into two smaller ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. I tried to go and get some balloons recently for a birthday. Unfortunately, I missed your birthday, Athena. But I heard about this, too, the fact that there's a shortage of helium right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. A lot more scarce and a lot more expensive. Oh, somebody, John just sent a message saying, was there some new helium discovered recently? I hope so, yeah. I haven't heard about that, but it's quite possible, yeah. Hopefully, that'll help the shortage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because mm -hmm, we use it in the lab and things, and it's become really expensive. <laughs> well, it looks like there's one more question. This is a very important question for everybody to know. Zeus, can you fly? Mercury is better at flying than I am. He has little things on his shoulders and stuff like that. So he's better. I just kind of leap and soar and stay on the clouds and tromp around and make shake the earth with my big feet there. <laughs> and I don't know if you saw earlier that my hair here is like a cloud and so often comes from cumulonimbus clouds and so I'm a living, walking, breathing demonstration of meteorology. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <it's> so you. Well. <laughs> we've got one more we've got great questions coming in and one more question as we were kind of talking about all of all of these issues with helium somebody's wondering how do we find helium oh <laughs> jeff do you want to talk about how we find helium um i don't know really how they find it i think it just comes from mines and things like that, but I don't know if they go look at look for it deliberately or if it just comes out when they find coal. You can put a big funnel over something. the ground and let it go up through the funnel because it's going to catch the air. You probably have to look for very specific rocks. And we have a lot of different tools that we use to measure the different gases in the atmosphere around us. And so there's a good chance that they measure the atmosphere in different parts of mines and look for those gases um, using those instruments. If people were watching earlier, we had Sounds instruments good. that measured the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we use here at INCAR, and a lot of different industrial uses probably have, eh, excuse me, probably have instruments that identify helium and hydrogen and other underground gases. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. And that is a perfect segue to take a quick break before our next session, which is all about that instrument for measuring carbon dioxide. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned it. <laughs> Great. So many thanks to Zeus and Poseidon and Athena for joining us today and happy belated birthday, Athena. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks for joining us everybody. And in just a few minutes, we will be back to explore measuring carbon dioxide with that special instrument that Athena mentioned. So hopefully we'll see everybody soon. <laughs>